don't run out of time and hopefully don't run over as well. Um, so the, the first idea we sort of introduced there was parallelism. The next idea is distributed computing, which is very similar to parallelism. Um, it's sort of the only step removal is that rather than trying to do these things inside the same CPU or same machine, you're now trying to do it among different machines. Um, so again, so sort of, you know, for you to try to do two tasks by yourself is a lot easier than for two people to try to do two tasks in many cases because, you know, you share a head, you have shared memory, you have shared um, access to joints and things like that, and so you don't have to tell yourself how to do a task. And of course, with distributed computing, you have the problem where if you have multiple different machines, you now have to send, you have to tell each machine how they're supposed to do the task, which means they need not only the data to do the task, but the task that they're supposed to perform, all of the libraries that that task requires, and that then becomes significantly more complicated. Additionally, with um, distributed machines, because it's not all on the same hardware, you have problems with sort of network delays, communications, file systems issues that become a lot more difficult. So they won't be reading the same data at the same time. They'll have, you know, a copy of it on each machine. And so these copies can get out of sync or maybe one version's corrupted and the other version's not. And so you run into these problems of sort of coordination that become a lot more difficult. And again, these aren't really computer specific problems. These also apply to sort of people in the same way that, you know, if you send someone a text message telling them to go pick up the groceries, you don't know if they got the text message until they respond to you. And so if they don't get the groceries, it could be because they didn't get it or because they didn't read it or because they read it and ignored it. And there's all these different things that can happen versus if you don't get the groceries and you tell yourself to do it, it's quite easy to know that, you know, you simply forgot it. And so it's a lot fewer kinds of problems that can go wrong. And so distributed computing examples are very much like dealing with groups of people. And so, you know, if you are, this should have come up just one at a time, but if you have 10 friends who sort of collectively know all the capitals of the world, how would you kind of solve this in a, you know, if you have a single country that you want to find the capital of, how would you figure this out? So if you know that you and 10 friends know the capitals of all the countries of the world, and you want to figure out who knows the capital of Yemen, how would you do this? Yeah? At the same time? Or go one person at a time? Yeah. Yeah. Right? If all of them know the same amount, then it doesn't matter which one you ask first. If maybe if one of them knows like half of all the options, you would go first to that person. Yeah. Even though like the, that person more likely is actually known. Yeah. Yeah. So the first approach is yeah to go to just each person one at a time in kind of any random order. You can make it much more performant if you go to the people who know the most or most likely to know. That you know, if one of your friends knows no capitals, you don't need to bother asking them every time. You can just sort of skip them. Um, so you can sort of sort that to make that slightly more efficient. But then sort of the next response, the next step of that would be, you know, if it's just 10 friends, you can just yell out Yemen and say the first person who knows the answer, just yell it back. And then you don't have to go through each friend one at a time. And so that would be then faster. Of course, that then has costs. If you now have hundreds of friends and you yell Yemen, they might not hear you or they might hear something else. And then, you know, if they all yell it at the same time, you may not be able to tell what they're trying to say, which are actually similar problems to what you have with computers trying to solve something as well. Um, so if each friend has money in their pocket and you want to figure out how much money you have in total, how would you go about doing this? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you'd go around the room with a pad of paper yeah. and say, how much money do you have? And you'd write it down and then, add them. and then add them all together. And so if it took each person a minute to figure out how much money they had, it would take you 10 minutes to figure out 
plus a few minutes to do math. Yeah, so they could do the figuring out their sum, but you'd still have to write down all the numbers and add them up. Yeah? What if I ask them to write, to have a paper, and they all fill out the paper? Yeah, so then they all write it there, but someone has to go through the number yeah, yeah, but then, like, it gets really, really quick. Okay, and if you had a thousand friends? Uh, maybe you have a hundred papers, and then <laughs> merge the papers up. Yeah? Yeah, but something still has to do the calculation. So the Excel makes it faster for sure. But if you have, yeah, any? I was thinking everyone take the learning and fills in one table and then you count that one file. It's faster than counting individual. It, is it? <laughs> if everyone like um, empties out coins and pockets and things like this, it'd be quite a mess. But yeah, you could do that. So if you had someone who was really good at counting, you could put all the money in one spot and have the really fast counter do it. <coughs> yeah. Yep, exactly. So that's the fastest way to do it by far and the most scalable approach. So that you have everyone pair off into, so you basically have everyone stand up. And then everyone, every person finds a partner and then they count their money, the partner counts their money, they add it together, and then one of the people sits down. And each of the people remaining find a partner and then they count the money, add it together, and then they sit down. And then each of the remaining people find a partner. And so what this lets you do it in sort of sort of log n time. Because each time you're able to get rid of half the people. And so if you had thousands and thousands of people, you're able to make very good use of the resources that you have in order to solve sort of a complicated problem. And so um, this is just to kind of give you an idea with these sorts of tasks that actually coming up with really efficient ways to doing to solve a problem is very different than solving the problem itself. It's so like you could be really good at counting money, but the approach where you just have two people come together is going to go much faster for a really large group of people because each time you reduce by half. And when you get rid of the bottlenecks like that and let everyone work, you have fairly simple tasks for everyone to do and you can split it up quite easily. Um, to now get to the um, Google interview question, how do you find the median coin value that everyone has? So if everyone just has pockets full of coins, how do you find the median coin of everyone? So your approach was actually not bad for this. As a starting point, yeah. So the easiest thing to do is you have everyone dump out all their coins in one table, and then you sort all the coins, and you take the one in the middle. And so that gets it done. Well, it gets a solution, which is always important, that you want to have something that leads to an answer and the right answer as your starting point, and then you try to figure out how to make it faster. But the question is then, how can you make it even faster than that? And again, it's a Google interview question. It's not supposed to be easy. And they don't include the answers in the uh, interview question. So there's lots of potentially different answers. Yeah? Do you have like, eliminate buckets or like counting things for the time? So get everyone to sort their coins into the different containers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can make your test significantly easier if you only have a discrete number of coins. So if you have like five different types of coins, like you do in most countries, you could easily take it and put everything in buckets and then just count how many is in each bucket or weigh each bucket, and then you'd have a fairly easy way of getting all of them. If you now have a slightly more difficult problem where it's not, you can't put them in buckets as easily. So let's say you're in like the Middle Ages where everyone has little pieces of silver and each silver weighs slightly different amount.
Any ideas? Yeah. Um, is media like is there a tricky way to do this? I think what if everybody takes their media point? Yeah. And then you average all the mediums. Is that the most work wise? So no, that's where it it often won't be completely wrong. No, but it's not correct. But it's not correct. No. So the average of medians is not the median you can't, you of a bigger. Can't do that with the mean value. If you if you ask for the mean value. You well, you can't do the average of means, but if you take all of the averages and all of the number of coin, a number of elements, yeah. then you can take all then you can make the sum and do it. So you can do it a little bit that way. Yeah. But you have these problems that you know if one of your friends had a million coins and everyone else just had one. Then you do the average of the medians, and the one with a million coins should be the one actually doing the median. Yeah. The other coins are kind of irrelevant. Yeah? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's probably not that far off, so it's probably a good guess. But it's not going to give. There are there are situations where it won't give you the right answer, and so it also depends on how accurate you need your answer to be. So if you're, you know, a bank, obviously you want to have the answer quite accurately because you know you're dealing with money. These are transactions. You don't want something to go wrong. But if you're just looking for kind of the median-ish value, then there's lots of tricks you can take to make the performance a lot quicker. Um, so again, so it's not necessarily a simple problem. The answer I have for this also potentially isn't the best answer. But one of the things that you can do is you can do sort of an iterative approach where you start off, you know, taking the mean. So you take everyone's mean, kind of take the average of it or the medians of medians or whatever you want to do as a starting point. And then you ask how many people have coins above this value or how many coins do you have above this value? How many do you have below? And that you can iteratively go through until you have exactly half above and half below. And what's quite nice about that is that counting the number above and below is easy to do in parallel because you can just have everyone yell out their number and they don't actually have to take all the coins out of their pocket and put it all in one table and then sort all of the coins that way. You can just have everyone do these fairly simple tasks and that you make use of everyone sort of doing tasks by themselves. And so this also, you know, again, applies to management that you know a good manager makes sure their employees are very busy and that means that you're doing a good job managing them that they're very busy and they don't need a ton of input from you and that a bad manager micromanages every task you do and it's probably faster if they actually just did it themselves and so the same thing with distributed computing a good distributed algorithm is much faster on 10 computers than it is on one and a really bad distributed algorithm is slower on 10 computers than it is on one. And so coming up with ways for separating out work, for making it clear what each machine has to do, is very important. And, you know, very interesting kind of thought problems to solve, but not necessarily problems if you're trying to finish your PhD or get a paper published that you want to have to deal with. You know, of course, if you're very interested in the theory, there's lots of work to do there. But if you're trying to count neurons in a brain, you actually don't really care how distributed computing works. You just want it to work well. Um, so kind of the next thing we'll go over is this idea of sort of resource contention. So a few of you had heard of this before. Um, this is sort of the problems you run into when you have lots of things going on at the same time and sort of a limited number of resources that you're able to work with. Um, so if you have memory, files, images that you're trying to read and write, um, network access, that all of these things are finite. You know, it's very difficult for two things to write to the same file at the same time. They have to kind of coordinate, otherwise you end up with sort of a mess. You know, if you imagine you and your friend trying to type a document in Google Docs together, it's theoretically possible that you both put your cursor in and start typing letters, but it will probably be a mess. And so you'd have to sort of agree beforehand, you'll work on this section, I'll work on this section, and then we'll kind of sync up later, rather than saying we'll both try to type the same intro paragraph at the same time. That would be very difficult to do, and in computers it's also very difficult to do. And so one of the um, simple problems for this is this dining philosopher's problem, 
where you have six philosophers at the table and six forks. Everyone needs two forks to eat. You know, you tell each philosopher, first take the fork on your left, and then take your fork on your right, and then start eating. And so what happens is everyone picks up the fork on their left, and no one can pick up the fork on their right, because all of the forks are taken, and everyone waits forever for a fork to become available, and it never becomes available, and so no one ever eats. And so this is sort of the, the deadlock problem. And this sounds quite trivial, you know, that you're like, well, of course, someone would just put their fork down so that someone else could start eating. And then, you know, they would say, once you're done, give it back to me and that's fine. But computers are incredibly dumb and would never, ever come up with this on their own. And so if you have something set up like this where you're looking for shared resources, you often end up in situations where you open a file and then you try to open another file and you can't. And another program has opened the other file and now tries to open your file and it can't. And both programs will wait forever for the file they need to become available. And your computer sort of doesn't crash, but just stops working completely. And so this is the idea of sort of a deadlock. And it's one of the reasons why distributed computing and parallel computing is difficult, because you have to make sure that these problems don't happen. And so the general challenges you have with this are coordination. So how do you break up a task well? Mutability. So this is where, you know, if you're trying to write the same Google Docs at the same time, how do you, you know, deal with this constantly changing document? You know, if you don't know what the other person's going to write, how do you make sure what you write sort of fits in with it well? And then blocking, which is this whole idea of deadlocks, where you want to take turns so that you don't have these kind of mutability problems. But if you take turns too much, then no one ends up doing anything. Distributed is all of this plus more. So you have to send instructions and data to other places. You have to have sort of fault tolerance. You know, if you have a thousand computers and one of them crashes, you don't want the whole task to fail. And data storage. And so how can you store everything and read it quickly and everything else? And so one of the things that will... Um, introduced just with the general computer science topics is this idea of sort of imperative programming versus declarative programming. Um, so most languages that you work with, so C++, um, C, MATLAB for the most part, are imperative languages. And so when you tell your computer to do a task, you sort of say, First do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. And so when you're writing code, you know, it's really one line after the other that you expect to go through. And that, you know, you manually control data management. So where is data? How is it loaded? When is it loaded? And you manually control sort of job and scheduling. So first run this task, then run this task. And so there's a lot of potential here to tweak and optimize performance. And so Whatever that thing is over on the sideboard over there is exactly that task. And so it's people using CPU and GPUs to optimize performance manually. And so this is the way most programming languages work. And it's quite um, detailed. So it's really telling someone step by step everything that they have to do. Declarative programming are languages like SQL, um, Erlang, Haskell, Scala, Python can all be declarative as well. And what really changes is that the focus is on the goals rather than the specific details. And so this is where you allow other tools to do this automatically manage and copying and transfer of data for you. And that scheduling happens automatically, but it's not always as efficient. So this is sort of what we started to talk about in the first lecture with sort of directed acyclical graphs. And so rather than thinking of your code as a list of instructions, you start to think about it more as a graph and that all of these graphs are connected and different parts of the graph have certain dependencies. And so with the soup analogy, you know, rather than saying first do this, then do this, you say first, you know, you say in order to, you know, make... To chop carrots, you first need to shop for veggies. And, you know, shop veggies means you buy vegetables at the market. Buy meat at the butcher, shop meat. 
and then heat water and wait for boiling water. To, and so you basically just express the dependencies between different tasks rather than each task has a long list of things that you're trying to do. And so this doesn't automatically mean that you'll be able to run faster or in parallel, but it makes it a lot easier for other systems to divide your task up into pieces. Versus if you've written a list, it can't easily figure out which things need to be done in which order. And so really, kind of the difference is, you know, if you were trying to do it in parallel, the imperative soup, you could have five people follow this list at the same time, and you would make five soups. But if you wanted to make one soup faster, there's really no way to do it with imperative declarations, because you just have this list. And with declarative soup, you have each one of these tasks, and you could give each task to a different person, and maybe some of these people wouldn't be doing anything. You know, obviously you couldn't, you know, start chopping carrots until someone had already shopped for the carrots. But you can divide things up and have everyone work on a different task and not be worried that something strange might happen if you have different people working on different tasks at different times. So if you tried to do that here, you could say you could also take these seven instructions and give each instruction to each person and just say go. But this is where you'd end up with this problem of sort of race conditions, where, you know, if you told the person, you know, person one to go buy carrots, peas, and tomatoes at the market, and then you told person three to chop carrots into pieces, you know, if person one was really quick, then you would have all the carrots and you could chop them into pieces and that'd be fine. But if they weren't, you don't tell person three to wait for person one. And so you start chopping air or a few of the carrots. And so you end up with a soup that, depending on how fast person one is, might be a completely different soup. And so that's where you get into these problems of race conditions, where if you've done it in sort of an imperative way and you try to split it up, it becomes very difficult to know exactly what's going to happen in which order. And then it becomes kind of non-deterministic which for programming and algorithms is a very, very bad thing to have accidentally happen. You know, if your website shows up and it's non-deterministic, sometimes, you know, the banner shows up and then the title, that's probably okay. But if you're trying to make a soup and sometimes the carrots get chopped and sometimes they don't, that's not a very reliable way of making soup. And so really the, the important parts of this is that you know, imperative is where you optimize it yourself, so where you spend a lot of time organizing how each task is done, what each core should be doing, how do you coordinate it, how do you make sure they access to the same, have access to the data they need. Um, you know, you can use cluster-based computing for this, and declarative is then sort of run everything at once and let, you know, a task manager take control of what's going on and make sure that everything happens quite well. Um, you also have this problem up here, whereas if you try to make the soup imperatively and you give each task to a different person, it then becomes quite difficult to know what has that person already done. You know, if you give chopped carrots into pieces to some person and that person crashes or falls asleep or stops chopping, you know, and you have half chopped carrots, how do you go and tell someone else to sort of complete that task? Because it's now they have to go, it's now not the same task, it's now find all the carrots that are already chopped, put them aside, and only chop the carrots that haven't been chopped yet. And so that requires quite a bit more work to tell someone how to do. And of course, in the image processing sense, you know, if you tell an algorithm to start running a filter and it crashes, then how do you finish the task? How do you know exactly where it crashed and how do you make sure you can sort of continue where that left off. Um, and one of the other things about declarative approaches is this idea of sort of lazy evaluation. And so when you break everything up into these tasks, you don't have to run anything when you describe the task itself. You wait until something's needed. And so you kind of do it at the back end of it, where you say, once I have, once someone wants a soup, then I'll start chopping carrots, chopping potatoes, boiling water. And once I start boiling or chopping carrots, then I'll start chopping for veggies. And that you sort of do it backwards, which means you don't spend time doing tasks that you don't need to do. 
And so, you know, in this case, yeah, anyways. Um, so the, the lazy evaluation is just sort of the approach of you put all the tests together and then you run them later. Um, so Q computing is just this idea of the, using sort of multiple different computers at the same time. This is sort of independent of imperative or declarative. This is kind of how you think about clusters. And so with clusters, you have resources, jobs, and sort of users. And so resources are the computers, the memory, the storage available. Jobs are actually what you're trying to run, and users are the people trying to run the jobs. And so with resources, you have to think about, you know, how many CPUs, how many GPUs does your task need, how much memory is available, how much memory is each task allowed to use, um, access to bandwidth. So if all of your tasks, when you start them, start downloading a terabyte of data, you know, that obviously would bring ETH to a halt if you had 60 computers all downloading 100% at the same time. You'd want to have some sort of way to say only one computer should be downloading at the same time. And then a given period of time. And so when you're using clusters, you don't have the machines forever. You know, in ETH, I think the longest job is allowed to be uh, 96 hours. And so you need to break your task up into 96 hour chunks at the longest. And if you want to schedule a 96 hour chunk, then of course that will take a long time because that means that computer could be blocked from anyone else doing anything for 96 hours. A job is then specifying a task that you want to run and the minimal resources to run with. And so obviously that includes execution time. Users are then account submitting jobs and this then requires some sort of user management. And so if you have one user submitting 100,000 jobs, you obviously don't want to run all the jobs at the same time because you don't have the resources for it and you have other users who want to be able to use the cluster. And so you need to come up with ways of sort of sharing the resources that are available fairly among all the users. And of course, if it's night and no one's on the machines, then there's no reason not to let someone take use of them. But if there's a lot of people competing for the same resources, then you want to give them to the people who have had least access to them or are most urgently needing to the job or financed the most part of the cluster. And so there's a lot of different things that come in to how you balance that out. Um, the structure of the cluster um, for us really isn't that important, but you sort of have this idea of a master node, worker nodes, and a scheduler. And so the master node is kind of the one you talked to. So this is sort of the manager of things. The worker nodes are where all the tasks are actually done. And so this is, you know, the nodes that get assigned to specific problems. And the scheduler is what's running on usually the master node, which decides which jobs will run with which resources. And so that balances the user requests, the resources, and the tasks that are being put in. Um, so we'll skip the databases part for now, just because we're running out of time, but we can cover that potentially later. Um, so now we'll actually get to the really core of big data stuff. We've done that a little bit before, but basically the volume, vol velocity, volume, and variety. There's also the five Vs, depending on which marketing material you read, but the main idea is that you have a lot of data that you need to process and you'd want to process it quickly. Um, you need to be able to scale well, so to handle a hundred or a thousand times as much work, and where you're starving for enough data. Um, so the AMP Lab, which has now been renamed to the RISE Lab at UC Berkeley, it's quite interesting talking to them because they're always struggling to get enough data. So they have way too much computing resources and not enough interesting problems to look at, which is kind of the opposite of what most people have at ETH, where you have way too much data and not enough algorithms or interesting analyses to do to the data. And so if you're starving for enough data, that means you've built an infrastructure that lets you handle lots and lots of really interesting problems. And to sort of simplify where big data came from, that, you know, the original or sort of biggest use case for big data when it first came out was Google dealing with um, their search machine. And so they had this algorithm called PageRank, which 
was going to run on every side of the internet and basically for each website on the internet it would say uh, run my secret page rank algorithm end and so to parallelize this task was fairly easy you could just say for every site on the internet, you know, you break up the sites into groups and each computer runs a group and now you have your page rank algorithm and it works quite well. The problem is, is that it's not actually the algorithm that they had. So the algorithm wasn't able to look at the website and say, this is what your page rank is. It had to look at all the other sites that linked to that website. And so basically, they had to go through every site in the internet, you know, make this new page rank object, and then for every other site on the internet, calculate if this site linked to the other site, and then add it to the page rank. And so that now your rank requires not just information about your site, but information about all the other sites that links to it. And so dividing this task now becomes significantly more difficult. So, you know, one of the things you could do is maybe you could divide up English sites and Chinese sites and have all the English sites run on one server and all the Chinese sites on another server. But of course, if some Chinese site links to an English site, you now have this problem that they're on different machines and so you can't share that information at all. The other option would be to have a really, really, really big, fast computer. And they looked into this, because they're Google, they spend lots of money on resources, and they decided that if they had one computer and they tried to run it on that one machine, it would take months to run PageRank once. And to make the task even more exciting for them, um, I think at Google right now, it's probably even higher, but a hard drive fails every 60 seconds at Google. So when you look at all the machines that are connected to them, the rate of hard drive failures is very low. But when you have thousands and thousands of computers, this becomes actually quite substantial. And so every minute, a uh, hard drive fails at Google. And so you need to somehow replace this. And you know what happens if a computer falls off in the middle of your page rank calculation? Do you have to restart it from the beginning? Um, you know, if there's earthquakes, if there's power outages, you know, how do you deal with this? And that page rank doesn't just count. And so it uses the old rankings of that page and iterates it. And so if you already have a high page rank, linking to other pages brings their rank up. And if you have a low rank, linking to those pages brings it down, which means you actually have to run the whole algorithm many, many, many times. And this becomes quite difficult. And so what Google um, came up with or the first tool they really built to solve this problem is called sort of map reduce. And so this will come up very frequently if you look into big data. And really the idea is rather than coming up with sort of your page rank algorithm, you build a tool for handling any kind of algorithm you could have and scaling it on to thousands of computers really well. And so what they decided was, if you can break a problem into map steps and reduce steps, and that you have a tool that does map reduce really, really well, then any problem you can break up into map reduce, you just put into the tool and it will scale. And so this was sort of the beginnings of this whole big data approach because it meant that you could focus on breaking your problem up into a map step and a reduce step rather than breaking your problem into a parallel. How do you deal with different computers? How do you load data? How do you manage data? How do you break up tasks? And that instead you just focus on what's the map? You know, how do you take input and transform it? And then how do you take all the transformed input and somehow combine it together? And so in a very trivial example, if you were trying to find sort of the sum of squares of a list, your map step would be squaring the values. And so if you had, you know, one, two, three, four, five, the map of this would be one, four, nine, sixteen, twenty-five. And your reduce operation would just be this sort of combining, adding them together. So the G of A of B is A plus B. And then you reduce on L, and then it's the G of G of G of G of one, comma, two, comma, three, comma, four, comma, five. 
and that you end up with a task broken down into MapReduce. And so this is sort of a super trivial example, but it just lets you kind of see what this is trying to do. And so what MapReduce does is it's a framework which is able to take all your input data, and so in this case it's just you know a very short list, break it into chunks across sort of all the machines you have in the cluster, apply map to each element, shuffle, repartition, or group the data between, and then apply reduce to each group, and then collect all the results and write them to disk. And that basically when you have your task structured in sort of these map reduce steps, then it makes it very easy for you to just submit this task as L, F, and G, and the map reduce tool you have will figure out how to run that really efficiently. And now you can divide your people into people that work on MapReduce who are really good at parallel programming and distributed computing and race conditions and thread locks and everything else, and the people who are thinking about algorithms and data science and everything in that area, and that they don't have to worry about parallel computing. And so you can really separate those two competences and have tasks that are really in different areas. And so one of the things they run into quite frequently here is this key value pair, where that rather than just having one input and sort of one output, you have a key value. So you have sort of two, a key and a value that comes out of the analysis that you're doing. And so if we do this for a simple example of counting all the words in a folder full of text documents, that what map would do is it would take a long string and return a list of all the words so text separated sort of by spaces, as key value pairs. And here the key would be the word, and the value would be one, because each word that you see here shows up once. You then say the grouping is performed by keys, and reduce adds up the values for all the things that are in the same group. And so if you had cat, dog, car, dog, car, dog, your map step would output cat, one, dog, one, car, one, dog, one, car, one, dog, one. So that you have, you know, dog repeated three times. You then have your shuffle and group, which would break it into cat, dog, and car. And you'd have sort of these instances. And your reduce would just add up all of the different values that you have. And so that you end up with this result. And we can now do this. And so we can perform this task to count all the lines of Shakespeare and find a word count that includes is included in it. And so here we have you know, a text file that has all, I think all of Shakespeare's plays in it, if I'm not mistaken. And so you can read it in and you can see that there's, you know, the first five lines are from A Midsummer's Night Dream, A Midsummer Night's Dream. You can run it imperially, uh, sorry, uh, imperatively in serial execution. And so this is what your code would look like to run it, and so you'd basically, for each line, you'd go through each word, you'd sort of split by words, you'd, you know, add one if the word was greater than zero, and that you could run through the whole analysis, you know, fairly quickly, and get sort of the most frequently word used words. And so we see the was used quite a bit, and Least frequent was Midsummer Nights, Wayne's, New Bent, Solemnities, Merriments. And so we see we have this, you know, nice analysis that we've done. And we can now do the same thing with MapReduce. And so what we have here is sort of a map function with lines to words, where we say, you know, if we give it a sentence, that it will give us the words back. This is where it's also important to kind of use testing. So here we have the, the doc testing where we show if we give it hi, I am Bob, that it actually gives hi, I am Bob back so that it works. Because when you're doing MapReduce, it's a lot harder to actually see what's going on in the background. And then we can use Dask, which isn't the same sort of MapReduce tool Google uses, but has a lot of the same functions in it to make sort of what are called bags, which are just their term for how we store sequences. And then we can run this map using this line to words on all the lines that we have. Oops. And then we can run the reduce step, which has been simplified to just be frequencies. 
And you can see all of these things run instantly because they're all lazy. So there's no actual computation being done until we say we want to print out the actual top 10 and bottom 10. And so now we can see that in three seconds we're able to get the top 10 words over all of the things in Shakespeare and the bottom 10 as well and that we get exactly the same result as we did before. And so what's quite nice about this approach, oh, we don't see that, is that we're able to then run this on multiple machines So here we can run it again interactively. And so this is just run on one computer, but we're able to see that we used you know, three cores of our machine and what each sort of task was working on during this analysis. And so we can see quite easily that we have um, made use of multiple different cores, even though we didn't write any parallel code. So we just wrote all of our code in sort of this declarative form, and Dask figured out how to efficiently divide this up into separate tasks. And so Hadoop is kind of the big tool that does this. Um, so MapReduce is internal at Google, so if you work at Google, that's one of the tools they have. Um, they don't use it as much anymore because they've kind of built the next um, followers to this. But Hadoop is the name of this that's being used at Yahoo and Microsoft and many um, Amazon larger companies to deal with their huge amounts of data. And so, you know, when you hear Hadoop, you can just kind of associate it with this map reduce approach. And then if you're able to divide your task into map and reduce steps, that you can use Hadoop. Um, there's also tools called Spark, which is sort of the follow up to Hadoop which then allows you to run much more complicated pipelines and is actually very similar to Dask in what you're able to do. And so you still focus on building these kind of analyses with certain components like map and reduce and that some other tool handles all the parallelization, the dividing up of the tasks and running it on different machines. And so it's really just expanding that vocabulary from map and reduce to join, group by, fold for each filter and adding caching to it. And so that was sort of the major changes that happened. And that really what you focus on is you focus on how do I solve my problem, what steps do I need, rather than how do I distribute it among different computers. And so Dask is the one we'll use in this class because it's the easiest to get started with. And you can use it on one machine and you can easily scale it to larger clusters. And so there's, again, lots of other tools that use um, directed acyclical graphs to do their kind of analyses. Um, there's tensor comprehensions, which for whatever reason didn't show up here. Um, which was sort of the last, one of the more interesting topics to show. Here, where um, this is an example from Facebook where they're able to take something described in sort of a very um, DAG way. So they take a fairly simple operation, so average pooling, which is just taking sort of an average over a region. And what they do is they automatically generate tons of different code to try to run this as efficiently as possible. And so you can see the first generations are fairly slow, but as they kind of iterate more and more, they're able to generate faster and more efficient code in order to solve this problem. And so they're able to find you know, a solution that takes 42 microseconds rather than the original ones, which it doesn't say, but I think took hundreds of milliseconds. And so you're able to get it to be much more efficient without doing any work, because if you've described your problem in a really um, generic way, other tools are able to take this and optimize it for you. And so that's really one of the key points of using these DAGs and approaches is that if you can focus on just what components need to be together 
what are sort of the map steps, what are the reduced steps, that you can then let another tool spend all the time to figure out how to run that efficiently, to figure out how to break it up, to make the best use of GPUs and CPUs, and that that's really the, the focus. And so here, we sort of do the same thing we did in the first lecture, where we have these, you know, simple uh, images. We try to add them together, and you're able to make sort of graphs out of it. And so here's sort of fairly simple graphs, and then we can start to use this actually for image processing. So for all the things that we've covered up until now, we can take a 3D image of foam, and we can perform some analysis on it. So here we have the image of the foam structure, and we want to calculate you know, a distance map. We want to find the bubbles. We want to figure out where the different shapes start and end. And then we can now break up the image into tiny pieces. And so here we sort of say the chunks are 20 by 400 by 400. And now we have sort of five pieces that make up the image. We can run a Gaussian filter on it. And so here we run Gaussian filters on the different chunks. And then we find the regions that overlap between the chunks, run the Gaussian filter on them, and then combine all of that together. We can then do morphological operations. So here we can perform sort of an erosion. And again, we perform this sort of overlapping. We do all the chunks themselves. Then we figure out what happens in the overlapping regions and then sync all of them together. And then we can do labeling. So here we have sort of a labeling approach where we take the little kernels that we find, we find all the objects in it, and then we mash all of those images together. And so here we end up with labels where there's kind of a discrepancy between the different groups, but that we're able to get labels for our whole image fairly quickly and make use of a lot of different computing resources. And so again, this is just done on my laptop. But of course, with clusters or larger machines and much larger data sets, you can scale much better using these kinds of approaches. And so here we can you know, perform a Gaussian filter quite quickly. What's that also very useful is that we can say, if we just want a single slice, so here we can perform a filter, and there we say all we want is the middle slice of the image then we can visualize exactly the computation it needs to do in order to get just that middle slice. And so rather than computing the whole image, you can take this lazy approach of just figuring out which pieces do you need to bring together in order to get just that slice as an output. And so that's where it becomes very helpful when you're dealing with really large data sets that you don't want to have to load in all the data in order to extract one piece. You can simply say, here's where the data are, and this is what I want to extract, and it will figure out which pieces you need to load in in order to do the operation you're interested in. Um, so yeah, that's the, the last part of that. These tools are then all kind of built for running on the cloud. And so you know, running this on one machine is quite easy, quite useful for testing. But of course, as you try to scale up, it becomes more difficult to do this on one machine or even with a cluster of machines because your needs are very kind of irregular. And so what cloud computing becomes quite useful is that you know, if you need to run a really large computation, <coughs> you off usually don't need to run them all the time. You know, If you're a PhD student, you collect a bunch of data, now you want to analyze it, and you want to analyze it as quickly as possible, but then you don't need to analyze it again for six months until you collect more data. And so this is where using other resources, you know, with Amazon or Switch or Google Cloud or any of these places allows you to take advantage of computers that are being professionally maintained for just a block of time that you're using it for. And so particularly if you've written everything using DAGs, you now have an image analysis pipeline that will easily scale to hundreds of machines that you can simply upload to a cloud machine and run and run on a much more powerful set of computers than you could run it on yourself. And so that's kind of where cloud computing becomes much more advantageous because you have the ability to sort of scale out very quickly. Um, and that I think we'll leave it there. The only last thing I wanted to show was sort of this example from
distributed image processing is difficult. So this is actually one of the development aspects of um, Dask, and this is a fairly simple operation for how to do labeling of a 3D array. And so this is the example that they want to run the labeling algorithm on. And this is the graph for running that simple analysis using multiple different machines efficiently. And so here, just what you see is that it's not a very simple task to come up with really efficient graphs for solving problems that have sort of lots of interconnected pieces. And so this is sort of much more related to kind of like the median coin problem of it's not simply running each piece individually and then bringing all the results together. It's a lot about how can you give different tasks to different machines in order to make sure you're making the most use of the resources you have. But um, so are there any questions on that? Um, so the exercises will cover how you can um, sort of run fairly basic analyses on the cluster here. So if you're an ETED student, you can use this cluster whenever you want. If you're in this class, you can use it during the course of the class with sort of the KBI account. Um, but it basically shows you a little bit about how to set it up and how to run sort of different tasks using NIME or Python on there. And then I think there were a few examples for how to... run sort of more complicated tasks. And so if you have, yeah. So there were examples of how to do sort of 3D image analysis in Dask, where you're then able to take, you know, large 3D images. So this actually came from one of the groups in um, ETET, sort of run by Vanessa Woods, where they published all of their data and it tries to reproduce some of their analyses. They did their analysis on the cluster here using MATLAB, and we do the analysis on Kaggle using uh, Python, but the results we get are very similar. And so they basically have different batteries, and you're trying to run fairly complicated analyses on really large images. And here we make use of the four cores Kaggle gives us, and I think 12 gigabytes of memory, but of course with more resources it would run even faster and then doing things like the distance map and other sorts of analyses inside of it. And then how to do sort of some of the basic steps on this with sort of TensorFlow and other similar tools and then um, Kaggle and then the NIME and Spark exercises show how to do this for, um, why does this look so bad? fix that link, um, but how you set up sort of a basic cluster using a job using Condor to run on the clusters that you have here, if you're interested. And then the last part, yeah, it was just some intro code for using Spark for people who are interested in actually trying to try using Spark because it's a a very popular tool. Um, for this class, it's not as relevant, but if you're interested in sort of exploring more, there's some possibilities for doing that. So I'll fix that link. So if there's no questions, then you can get started on the exercises. Um, next week will be a guest lecture um, from Michael Prumer, who used to work at, um, I believe, Roche. Yeah, he used to work at Roche and sort of drug discovery and so high content screening. So how you have microscopes that are taking thousands of images every day and how you automate the image analysis for those microscopes to figure out if certain drugs are working, if cells are healthy, what's happening to the nuclei, are they growing, are they shrinking, all of these other quantifications. 
and now sort of works at Nexus, which is the sort of personalized medicine center um, at ETH. And so um, he has quite interesting presentations and quite um, useful sort of examples of where a lot of the tasks that we um, cover are actually applied and which of these things are actually relevant when you're working at Roche or Novartis or one of these companies doing sort of drug discovery and how do you apply these sort of to those problems. Um, and then of course there's some examples of how you can actually do this and there's a data set on Kaggle that's very similar to the high content screening they do where you try to do a fairly simple predictive model if the C. elegans worms are living or dead. You know, so if you're testing a drug, you want to make sure it doesn't kill C. elegans worms because if it kills them, it will probably kill mice or humans. And so it's a very simple, easy screen to do. But you have, as a starting point, images. And so how do you take from an image and decide if a, an elegans is alive or not? Um, and then May 16th, uh, sort of still to be decided, there were some suggestions about doing sort of like a Kaggle competition or um, a sort of more in deep learning. Are there any other ideas for lectures or any interest 